That took four minutes to figure out. Hi, I think this is working. So we'll see. I couldn't get it to work on the um, on the original link because. Where did you post it? What? Did someone say something? Yeah. 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 Hi, this is Kathy Brennan. I'm in Rehoboth Beach with a bunch of women talking about feminism. Hi, women. Say hi. <laughs> and um, this is a live stream of my presentation on gender identity and the law because gender identity seems to be a hot topic now for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, it will help if you laugh harder at my jokes. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, so I had posted on YouTube that I was doing a live stream and it created like a, a video page and then I couldn't get that one to launch so we created a new one so I'm sure there's lots of people on the other link being like where is this asshole but I'm here on this other link and thank you for bearing with me um, why are we doing this presentation advanced slide uh -huh. <laughs> the purpose of this presentation is really because I'm a masochist. I, um, <laughs> I, oh, I, I kind of did what I wanted to do in 2011, 2012, and then I've been trying to back out of this conversation for many, many years. I had backed out of this conversation, and then there were events that occurred last summer in my own community in Baltimore that caused me to have to come back out, which I really resent. But I also feel very strongly about my history as a lesbian activist, particularly my community. I care about my reputation and my integrity in that community. I honestly don't care about people on the internet or what they think of me. But I live in Baltimore. I've lived there for 20, someone do math, 1995, 24 years. I've lived there a long time. So when, when I get told that I'm doing things at Gay Pride and all that stuff that I didn't do, that pisses me off. Like that pisses me off. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm here again saying things that are unpopular in the community, which is kind of what I do, right? So uh, also, why this presentation? In addition to me being a masochist, I want to talk about the conundrum between sex and gender identity in the law. I am not interested in the cultural conversation around gender identity. If you want to have that conversation, do your own workshop, have that panel. I will not attend it. I don't care. I'm talking about the law. I am an attorney. I only care about the law because the law is what we have to live with. We are bound by the law. So we need to make damn sure that what the law says we want to be bound by. We need to understand it. It's not enough to say, oh, my God, men in dresses. Have you not seen a man in a dress? Like, who cares? Okay. Anyway, in addition to pointing out the problem, I also like to propose solutions. If any of you read the 2011 letter that was um, co-written by me, there's a solution in that letter. It's in a footnote. <laughs> Hint, scavenger hunt. Like, we've <laughs> talked about this issue for many, many years. The UN letter is like one of those things everyone has talked about it, but very few people have read it. Please read it. Please read the letter and, like, understand what is the conundrum in the law between sex and gender identity. Um, and the last thing we'll talk about a little bit, but probably more at the open mic, is how do we create solidarity with constituencies to advance the rights of women and girls in civil rights law? I support anti-discrimination protections for transgender people, period. Okay? Yes. I do. Yes. Okay? Yes. If, if that's unpopular, so be it. I don't think anyone should be discriminated against because of their gender identity. Yes. Next slide, please. So here are some principles for my talk. Um, women and girls matter, that is not negotiable. Irrational discrimination is wrong. Um, people have a right to live their lives as they choose without harming others. That is, I mind my business, you mind your business. If your business gets up in my business, then it is my business. But if you're out there living your life, doing your thing and you are not bothering anyone, have a good life. I hope you find love, peace, joy, happiness. I hope you don't inflict pain and suffering or any, on anyone else because if you do, you'll have to answer to a bunch of angry radical feminists, right? Because we care about number one, which is what? Women and girls matter. Right. So, continuing. Transgender people have a right to exist and be happy. There is this thing right now where people talk about transgender doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. I'm like, well, guess what? It seems to exist. It might be, you know, a capitalist nightmare. It might be something you don't agree with. It might not be your religion, but it exists. 
So you can keep saying, the earth is flat, the earth is flat. <laughs> I mean, it exists. It exists in as much as any other personal belief. Mm-hmm. So however you characterize it, transgender people, whatever they call themselves, they have a right to, to live their lives and be happy. Last one, I struggle with this a lot. Try not to be an asshole. <laughs> This is serious. I do struggle with this. I'm sure. I, I, <laughs> all right. So anyway, that was more. That should have got more of a laugh. Yeah. Everyone knows I'm an asshole. Okay. Title seven. So title seven is, is important to talk about for for many reasons, and I could talk about this probably for four hours, but then more women would walk out than just walked out at the beginning of this panel. Um, <laughs> Which I actually appreciate when women walk out of my panels because I do not brook inter- interruptions. I, I don't interrupt me when I'm talking. Thank you. I'm reserving my time. Uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Maxie. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like banter, but like you know, grandstanding on my time. I'm like, you can grandstand on your own time. We put a call out for women to do workshops. You can grant anyway. Anyway, Title Seven is the Anti Discrimination Act. It was passed in 1968. It's an extremely important piece of civil rights legislation because they added sex to Title VII because they were trying to kill it. (laughs) I mean, that's that that is a true like they're like, you know, you know, because the civil rights is like huge for like uh, ending race discrimination or taking steps in the law to end race racial discrimination. Like sex, what's that? Who cares? Like it. But it passed. Law passed. Um, Sex discrimination takes different forms. At its most basic form, sex discrimination involves treating someone, an applicant or employee, unfavorably because of their sex. So it's like, you apply for a job with me, I'm like, I'm not giving you a job, you have a vagina, Psh, go away. That doesn't really happen so much anymore, but it used to happen a lot. And I know the, the women who are older than me are like nodding their heads, they're like, yeah. Um, discrimination against an individual because of gender identity, including transgender status or because of sexual orientation discrimination, Uh, is discrimination based on sex. However, it's treated differently in case law. At the time Title VII was passed, there was no thought about gender identity. Sexual orientation was still a crime, so like that wasn't in civil rights legislation. Um, Title VII is a very broad law, so it prohibits both hiring and firing based on sex, also prohibits uh, disparate treatment based on um, terms and conditions of employment. Um, And then it also covers sexual harassment, which we're not really going to talk about today, but is an important thing to note. And that came in through case law, because originally, as I said, the only thing that was um, prohibited in Title VII was discrimination based solely on the category of sex. Next slide, please. Um, This is probably like more legal nerd than it needs to be, but I I just wanted to mention there's different there's different ways to get at sex discrimination. There's disparate treatment, which is me saying like. You can't have this job because you're female. And then there's disparate impact, which is like a, a neutral policy that has a disparate impact on a protected class. So if I adopt a policy that says, I, I just made this up about bench pressing 200 pounds. I, there's probably lots of women who could do that. I can't do that because I'm out of shape and cold, but other people can. But the point here is that you can uh, challenge uh, a policy or practice on either theory under Title VII. Next slide, please. So this is hugely dense. I'm not going to read this slide, but Price Waterhouse versus Hopkins. How many women here have heard of this case? Please all raise your hands. Yeah. If you haven't heard of this case, we're going to take a minute to hear from the woman herself on video. She's not here, but in a minute. Oh, here she is. Hopefully this will play. Can you get it to play? This is a tech issue. But I'll, I'll talk about Ann Hopkins. Oh, it's going. Okay. okay. So you want to play it now? Yeah. When I first started off at Two Shots, I was an, almost an instantaneous policy violation, violation of nepotism policies, which were used much, much, much to the disadvantage of women in universities in those days, and which no longer exist. I was a, a violation because one could one could live in sin with one of one's colleagues. At, at, a, at a big eight firm, but one couldn't marry one because then one became a policy violation. The instant I arrived. Okay, so I just paused it right there because, so who, who does this woman remind you of? Like any lesbian you've met at a women's music festival? <laughs> like she's a straight woman 
who uh, was working at Price Waterhouse and was fantastically successful at her job, like brought in more business than any other associate who worked at Price Waterhouse. This woman has written a book. I encourage you to get it and read it. She, she was an amazing success, but she presented like that, right? So she's not stereotypically, quote, feminine, to use that word that we you know, don't like, but she doesn't have long hair. She wasn't wearing a dress. She wasn't wearing heels. And so she was nominated for partnership at Price Waterhouse, and she was denied partnership. And the feedback had nothing to do with her business generating skills because everyone acknowledged she was amazing. All the feedback, well, she's gruff. Well, she's mean. Well, she's not nice to staff. Well, she should wear makeup. Well, she should try to soften her look. So all of these types of criticisms, which would not have been aimed at her if she had been a male. male. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so Ann Hopkins sued them under Title VII and yes. took her case all the way to the Supreme Court. And the lower court said sex discrimination under Title VII doesn't include or recognize, doesn't include or recognize what you're trying to assert. Like you're trying to say that you didn't get the job because you didn't work, you know, you were, you were too hard. You didn't get the partnership because you're too hard. It wasn't about your sex. And the, the Supreme Court of the United States, this is an extremely important case for women's rights. I really encourage you to read it. I really encourage you to watch this video. We'll, we'll play it in full more. Um, a little bit, but stands for the for, for the proposition that sex under Title VII includes sex stereotypes. And I don't know the exact percentage, but the majority of litigation under Title VII is about sex stereotypes. If we did not have this theory, all of those women wouldn't have a remedy. Can you want to keep going? At Price Waterhouse, I was another policy violation because my husband was about to make partner at Touche Ross. And you couldn't be a spouse of a partner in another big eight firm. About fortunately, my husband left uh, Touche Ross, and I was up for partnership at Price Waterhouse. We can't break. One of the only reasons I'm sure that this book got published, and anybody ever read it, or anybody ever cared about it, is because I had a rather remarkable career, and Price Waterhouse was a rather remarkable firm. I was. One doesn't get big things done without a few ripple effects here and there. And I probably am not, especially when I'm in a hurry, I am probably not the most charming person you'll ever meet. So, <laughs> does everyone understand why I love this woman? Yeah. Yes. yeah. I'm actually pretty charming, though. No, <laughs> Most people who actually know me, I mean, I don't have any. So, so she, she's amazing. Like, she, like, had the courage of her conviction to say, this is wrong. This is not right. She didn't want to wear a dress. She has a, 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 a monogram shirt with her initials <laughs> right here. I mean, she died like last year, and I feel very sad that I didn't get a chance to write her a letter thanking her because we all owe a debt of gratitude to this woman and to this case. So um, the slides are online, and you, you should. This, this video came from YouTube. That's why the sound wasn't so great. Like, it wasn't great as it was uploaded, but we'll link to that too. And please watch the whole thing. And, She's really great. So anyway, Anne Hopkins is the hero. Anne Hopkins, everybody. <laughs> okay, so other theories under Title VII. Um, in 1989, now Title VII covers sex stereotypes. Sexual harassment was picked up in another Supreme Court case that I'm not recalling and is not really important for this discussion. Sexual orientation has had a different and bumpier road. So when Title VII passed, immediately in the 70s, gay liberation activists were like, yeah, this includes us. And they filed a series of lawsuits. And quite, in my opinion, sex, discrimination based on sexual orientation is sex discrimination. 
uh, discrimination based on gender identity is sex discrimination because it's sex stereotypes. So theoretically, I think the legal theory was right. The courts weren't ready for it culturally to do it. So there's very bad cases from the 70s and the 80s saying, no, 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 you can't sue under Title VII uh, on a um, claiming discrimination based on sexual orientation. But that has start, that started to change recently. And there's actually um, uh, good, good cases now that say, yes, you can. So um, our federal court system is divided into um, circuits. So Katie, how many, how many circuits are there? There are 11 plus the DC circuit. Thank you. <laughs> so um, there's 11 circuits, um, federal circuit court of appeals, and they cover different states. And so for when, when, a, when a particular circuit rules on something, that's the law for those states. And then usually what happens when something gets to the Supreme Court is there's, there's um, a conflict between the various circuits. So there's some circuits that say, yes, sexual orientation is covered under Title VII, and some that say, no, it's not, or haven't considered it. So you have like a patchwork of laws. So um, it, unless you're a gay person that lives in a state that also covers sexual orientation discrimination, you may not be protected unless you live in one of these circuits, but it's very onerous to file litigation under Title VII. So like your protection is to the extent you can hire a lawyer to sue, but it's better than nothing, right? So. This is like a mushy, like it could be better, which is where the Equality Act comes in. Next slide. So there's actually much better case law under Title VII saying that gender identity is um, a protected characteristic under Title VII, and this is because of the Price Waterhouse case, um, which is, you know, ironic in a way, this great feminist case, right? But this, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so the Equality Act um, defines gender identity as the gender re related identity, appearance, mannerisms, or other gender related characteristics of an individual, regardless of the individual's designated sex at birth. The only way we understand that is if we understand sex stereotypes. And we understand sex stereotypes in the law because of Price Waterhouse. So there, this is the origin of this crappy language. And it is crappy language, as we've been pointing out for many, many years, because it's like, how do you define it? Blah, blah, blah. Yes. But if you root it in that case, you then understand this is what it means. Unfortunately, that's all that's in the statute, right? Okay. So we've all agreed that discrimination in most contexts based on gender identity is bad and wrong, right? We all agree with that. Okay, there's no one in here that thinks we should discriminate based on sex stereotypes, right? Okay. There's probably someone out there. Hi, person out there. <laughs> also, um, I, I sent the old link to my kids to watch, and, and if, if they're watching that, they're not seeing it. So, okay, can you text them? Do you have? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, my whole family knows about the stuff that I do because I don't live my life in any kind of closets anymore. And um, that's been fun, raising children with this analysis. So they're very smart. The Equality Act covers a number of federal laws. So um, a little background on uh, federal anti-discrimination legislation as regards sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, in the 90s and 2000s, there was a law that was um, introduced into Congress repeatedly called the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. I'm sure some of you may have gotten alerts from the Human Rights Campaign back in the day or like mailing. You know, the, it was the law to amend just Title VII. It didn't pass. Like it, Just people weren't ready. So now we have the Equality Act, which is a monstrous piece of legislation. It's very big. In, in scope, it's not so big. So it's not so big if you download it and read it, but it, what it amends is huge. It, it, it's going to amend laws that prohibit discrimination in employment, housing, credit, education, public accommodations, federally funded programs, and jury service. So that's much broader than what we just been talking about. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why this is happening now um, and why there's such momentum behind it right now. Part of it has to do with the politics in the United States at the moment. 
we have a, a very we have a very divided country. And so this issue of advancing civil rights protections for LGBT, I know, I know acronyms, but like this is the Democratic Party view. It's, you know, quote the right thing to do, but quote also raises a lot of money for them. And is quote kind of the right thing to do. Like, so there's like, you know, here's a way to distinguish ourselves. Here's a way we are not the other people. For the other people, you know, this is good for them too because in any type of political movement, there's always a call and response, and it's like who's who's issuing the call and who's responding. Um, right now, the the Democrats have thrown down this gauntlet of this this huge piece of legislation, and it's gotten the response it's gotten from the Republicans, some of which maybe deserved, even if I don't agree with how they're talking about it. Uh, so. Just before we dive into it, I just want to reiterate, we can agree no one should be denied credit because of their gender identity or because they're gay, right? Like a credit card, we all agree with that. Employment, generally, access to public accommodations, like going to the mall, like public accommodation, like people have a right to live their life and move freely. If you don't agree with that, I think you are a bigot. And I'm saying that very clearly. Like if you are opposing the Equality Act entirely, you are a bigot. I'm sure that's unpopular. I don't care. And if you think someone shouldn't serve on a jury because they're transgender, what's wrong with you? Like, who cares about that? Moving on. So, as we've pointed out before, um, the problem with the Equality Act is, is where it conflicts with the rights of women. So, it behooves us as thoughtful, intelligent, radical feminists to carefully go through the legislation and parse out our exact objections to the bill. What's happening right now is a mishmash of cult, mish is a shit storm. I hope my kids aren't watching that. Um, they've heard me say that before. Um, <laughs> what's happening right now is cultural arguments. The testimony that we've seen opposing VAWA coming from radical feminists and opposing the Equality Act coming, coming from radical feminists is a cultural argument. I understand the anger that women have over this issue. Personally, I understand this at a very deep level. I've been personally living with this issue since I first started organizing in the gay community when I was at Fordham University in the late 80s, early 90s. I get it. But anger does not give you the right to say fucked up shit. And laws in our country are made through a process, like it or not. The process is, here's legislation. You provide comment. You talk to your reps. Develop your position. If you want to go with the position like oppose the Equality Act, oppose the equality act totally, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. I will think you're a bigot. So if you care what I think, which most people don't, <laughs> you know, go ahead and do what you're doing. I would rather look at the law and say, okay, where are the problems? So in my opinion, the key things we at Radi as radical feminists should be concerned about are areas where women are vulnerable due to circumstances from which they cannot escape. Okay? So these are women in prison, women in homeless shelters, women with targeted direct services, like support services for women in prostitution or exited women, transitional housing for women, including exited women, temporary emergency shelters, domestic violence shelters. Also, conditions of employment requiring contact with males. So my, I don't know if people know this, but my mom was a prison guard in New York State for 25 years in a men's prison. My mom is my feminist mentor, role model, hero. Um, and she, she worked with violent sex offenders in the prison she was in. Like, that's where they sent the violent sex offenders. Um, she was not ordered to, to do any, like, physical contact with them because sex matters. They had male guards do that, right? That wasn't discrimination. That wasn't irrational discrimination. That was rational discrimination. If, if someone all of a sudden was deciding to order my mom, search that dude, Holy hell. And that's what's at risk right now for women in certain jobs. It's not like you going into a store and a trans person waits on you. 
I don't, who cares? If you go to a store or a restaurant and your waiter is a trans person and it upsets you, leave. You know, I'm, this is law. This is serious business. I'm not interested in eradicating how people express themselves because as a gay person, as a lesbian, I have a huge interest in being able to express myself how I want. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Next slide. So talking through the Equality Act, public accommodations. Um, as a general rule, we've established no one should be discriminated against when they go to the mall or a store or a coffee shop. Like no one can, you shouldn't care about that. People should have a right to move freely and engage in commerce, right? If you're a business owner, why wouldn't you want people in your store? Okay. Um, but the Equality Act amends these truly public accommodations to include things like establishments that provide health care and salons. So anyone who hears salons, <laughs> who is that guy, Jonathan, how do you say his name? Yanif, the guy who went around to all the, the like estheticians in Canada and was like, wax my balls, I'm a woman. I'm making fun of him specifically. You can laugh at that. <laughs> like, and those women are like, um, okay, ma'am. Like, you know, like the Equality Act is, is, is trying to enshrine into federal law that that person would have a cause of action if a woman quite rightly declined the invitation to take your money to wax your balls. There are women who are out there who will take the money to wax your balls. I mean, so it's like, go somewhere else. I personally do not think there should be a federal cause of action for that type of, quote, discrimination. Um, same with health healthcare establishments that provide health care. That's kind of broad. You know, would that include, right, crisis that provides therapy? Mm -hmm. You know, like I I do not want to share the, the, the traumatic tales of my experiences with male violence with a man, however he presents himself or whatever he calls himself. I want, I think it's, you know, women have a, a, an argument like, hey, I care about that. So with this amendment, specific, this, this alleged introduction specifically, that's how I would target my criticism. And I think if you go talk to your representatives, does everyone know who their representatives are? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I, I encourage you, go talk to them. Like they, they are pretty accessible. Like they, it's not like they're a senator. Okay, I just, I'm sorry, Russ, you're very important. Um, go talk to them and like say like, here are my specific concerns. Next slide, please. Okay, so this this amendment is, is I think, from a, from a cultural, like historical perspective, is really offensive. Um, we in the United States had um, de, de jure, discrimination, which is discrimination in law, right? So prior to federal legislation to ban segregation, segregation was the law of the land. Like black people were prohibited by statute from accessing services, from entering buildings, from having, you know, going to school with white kids. Like a long, ugly, painful history. There's no comparable history. Siri just thought I was talking to her. So I wasn't. Um, there is no comparable history that exists for trans people or gay people. Our civil rights path is really different. Like, really different. Like, we, we understand this, right? There's no, like, Jim Crow laws for gay people or trans people, right? So, so this, is, this is offensive to me. But my personal offense isn't enough to like say like don't you know don't support this um amending this here is problematic because there's good reasons why women need segregation right because male violence exists so think about places uh where where women have their own space this would if, if this amendment passes this would this would like give every trans person every gay person a, a weapon to use to get in their space so this is something to importantly squarely draw attention to and to, to have reasons why you're drawing attention to it. Women need their own space because male violence exists. That's why if male violence didn't exist, you know, we probably would need our own space because <coughs> we're more fun, but you know, from a policy, this is the policy perspective. Um, 
Desegregation of public facilities. Um, this is also very important for the same reasons we've been discussing. It's important to talk to your representatives and draw attention to the fact why this is a problem because a public facility is, is a facility owned or operated by a state or local government, like jails, jails, right? So you're, you're housing a woman in a cell with a trans woman. You're housing a man in a cell with a trans man. Um, this is a problem. <laughs> and there are documented cases in the United States. We don't have to look to the United Kingdom for this. There's documented cases in the United States, and a lot of these are on GenderIdentityWatch.com, which I know a lot of people haven't wanted to use as a resource because I'm associated with it. And all I can say to you is that you people are dumb. Like there is a lot of material on that website created by a team of women and men. Men wrote for Gender Identity Watch. Some of them were trans women. <laughs> like who are concerned about this very conflict. So I don't know why we're looking to the United Kingdom for these cases. They are here. Your representatives don't care about the United Kingdom. They're like, we don't live in Great Britain. There is a thing like a revolution. Like, who cares? Like, be relevant. Be relevant. And like get those cases. And if they happen to be in your jurisdiction, that's all the better. You say you're rep, like I think there's a case in Philly where these women sued because this, this trans woman was housed with them and the, the prison thought she was a woman. And the, the prisoner was like, that's a man. <laughs> like, you know, so like there are cases, look at those cases. That is the problem. Next slide. All right, so desegregation of public education. This is another one of those ahistorical amendments as we were talking about earlier. There, there has never been a case of systemic government discrimination against gender, based on gender identity and sexual orientation that excluded trans or gay kids from schools and made them go to their own schools and drink out of their own water fountains. I mean, unless I'm missing that in my history books. Am I missing that? No. That never happened, right? <laughs> okay. So this, this matters somewhat. It doesn't matter in the provision of actual classroom time. Like, how does it matter? Like your kid is in class with someone who's gay. Your kid is in class with someone who's trans. Maybe they'll make a friend, you know? Like that is not so, so troubling. This is where the what about the children stuff comes up. There's this whole like vein of gender critical feminism now that's like, they taught the children about gay people in class and I didn't know and I didn't have permission and now my child knows gay people exist. <laughs> Thank you. One laugh. <laughs> How could they teach my children about that perversion, gender identity? That's so bad. Now they know that exists. Like schools exist to, to teach you things so you know they exist. Like that's why you go to school. <laughs> right? And like government, government, if you're going to a public school, the, the government has public policy interests in advancing whatever curriculum it wants. So like, if you don't support that, like lobby your school board, that's all good. But like, apparently that's happened some places and like, that's what they decided. And so to be like, oh my God, I found out about this thing. I'm like, you need to get more involved with your child's life maybe, I don't know. That's my thought on that. I know other people have different opinions because opinions, but that's my opinion. Oh, can you go back? So, Implementation matters though with education, and we'll talk more about this, because how does how does a school handle transition? How does a, a school handle like where a kid who, you know, is trans uses the locker room? This is obviously important and matters, and it's worth talking about. It's hard to hear this issue when you're using terms like calling five-year-olds pedophiles. Like I've heard a lot of really angry rhetoric around this and like talk demonizing the children at issue, and I'm like, look, you know, you think it's child abuse to trans a kid. That's your opinion, that's great. People aren't necessarily gonna hear what you're saying when all you're doing is yelling about this hypothetical child you don't actually know. And you're not really talking about this hypothetical child in a loving, caring way. So like, I care about girls, I care about, ch I care about children, I care how we talk about this issue, if this issue is important enough to talk about, talk about it in a way that you might be effective and you might be heard. Because um, right now what's happening is like there's a five-year-old rapist in the classroom. And I'm like, I don't know. Really?
are people saying? People are really saying this. I will post this and like share that like, this is how people are talking about this issue. Um, I think trans kids have a right to be safe in school, just like I think I have, my kids have a right to be safe in school. Like kids have a right to be safe. I don't think this needs to be federal law. Like that's another thing. Like why is this a federal law? And that might be a good point to raise with your representative. And we'll get to this more in a little bit. Um, not everything is within the province of federal law. Like we have a, a I'm really losing people now with this discussion. It's like federalism, states rights. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, federal. I'm glad like there's one, this is why we're dating. <laughs> All right, so federal funding. This is a land grab, like this, this is horrible. So this is, if you take any federal funding, um, you can't discriminate on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. This is a huge land grab. This is bad. So like anyone who gets any kind of a grant to provide like, you know, domestic violence services, homeless shelter, like they, they can lose their funding. That is a problem, a big, big problem. Because as we know, the reason we're having this conversation is because male violence exists. So please definitely raise that as an issue. Next slide. Okay, I just give an example of programs receiving federal financial assistance uh, or sex versus gender matters. Um, this slide is online. Please feel free to like use it if you want to write letters to your, your representatives who are all very important and have very important jobs <laughs> to point out to them just how broad this is. Because the way that laws work is that special interest groups write bills and representatives take credit in many cases, don't read them. So you've read them, tell them what's in there. This is bad, this is bad, this is not good, this federal funding piece. Next slide, please. Okay, so employment, we talked about earlier that, that people should have a right to have a job, earn a living, like, you know, why not? Um, bonafide occupational qualifications is, is one of those things that's a problem. Um, a bona fide uh, occupational qualification is like a loophole in Title VII that says you can't discrimination, discriminate based on sex unless that discrimination relates to a bona fide occupational qualification. What, what the Equality Act will say is that for purposes of that, gender identity has to include, or sex has to include gender identity. So this gives us the, the, the woman who is like working at TSA and like here comes someone who's not a woman. <laughs> Who's like, I demand to be searched by a woman. Like, and this has happened, and this is also documented on Gender Identity Watch. So there are actually examples of this happening. Like, that's the kind of thing you want to surface, you know? And like have your representative say to your face, Well, I don't care about her. She could get another job. And then you can say, Well, I'm gonna run for the House of Representatives, asshole. You know, like, but like that's important. Um, the other way around is less important. I fly a lot and you know if 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 I, and I also get pat down I get called out for a pat down a lot I they always say it's random <laughs> how many how many like butch lesbians have had random searches and you yeah yeah it's like do you look like a weirdo you're gonna get a random search <laughs> um, and I there you know I've never had the occasion where a trans woman that I knew of was like patting me down but you know and I actually probably wouldn't care but other people do care and like, you have the right to say like, I, I would like a search done by someone else. Um, or you, in some instances may be like, ah, I'm not flying today. Like, I'm leaving. <laughs> it's some, in some instances, but you can remove yourself from that situation. It's harder for the security guard that's being told they have to pat down a woman with balls. Next slide. <laughs> so just, <laughs> so if this person comes at you and is yelling at you, <laughs> it's a little comic relief. It's man. <laughs> it's Superman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if, if 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 you're like at the GameStop and like this person is there, you can leave. If you're like if this is your TSA agent, you can leave. If you're the TSA agent and this is the person coming in, you have a problem. Like that's the problem I'm trying to solve for. Is that woman in that position? That prison guard? My mom? I'm basically doing all this for my mom. Thank you. She's retired now. Okay, next slide. 
All right, so this is the big problem with this bill. And so this is what gets lost in all of the like, you know, like very uh, colorful language that has been flying around in Congress and hearings and on the internet. Um, this law will amend Title II, which covers public accommodations, which you talked about, Title III, which covers public facilities, Title IV, which deals with desegregation of public education, Title VI, regarding federal funding, Title VII, which is employment, and Title IX, which is education. Title IX is, all, we didn't talk a lot about Title IX, but Title IX is also an incredibly important piece of feminist legislation. Um, the Equality Act will provide that with respect to gender identity, which has that terrible definition we talked about, an individual shall not be denied access to a shared facility, including a restroom, a locker room, and a dressing room that is in accordance with the individual's gender identity. This is a huge plan grab. Also, where's my dressing room? I want a dressing room. Like, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really entire. I, I, anyway, um, sorry. Um, this is a huge land grab. This is enact, this is, would enact into federal law as a federal law standard that bathrooms, locker rooms, dressing rooms have to be in accordance with what I say I am. That seems to be a huge overreach, even for the most extreme Democrat, but maybe not since they're all supporting it. <laughs> that's, that's big. Generally, the way that the, our dual system of government works is like the federal government is like, we're going to deal with things that are our thing. And the states are like, that's cool. We'll deal with the things that are our thing. This seems like a state thing. This seems like a local thing. Like this does not seem like something we need a federal statute to tell us. And it's a huge problem if this gets passed because we have something called the Supremacy Clause in the United States Constitution, which says federal, the federal constitution trumps everything, federal law trumps everything else, and then state law. So any state laws that conflict with this, at the end, maybe. Any, any laws that conflict with this, like, it doesn't matter. So that's a problem. I mean, I think people know how I personally feel about bathrooms. I personally don't care. I do personally care about locker rooms because like in a locker room, we're changing our clothing, right? And there's lots of cases about men who identify as women. And all of these are on genderidentitywatch.com who have taken advantage of that situation. And even if they're not taking advantage of that situation, I don't want to get naked in front of anyone, let alone a dude. Well, in a locker room. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a land grab. And there's there's a couple ways to approach it. You can, you can approach it as like talking about women's safety, women's privacy, male violence exists. You can also talk about it as like this, this seems like an encroachment on like states' rights. Because there are many states that have enacted laws that have struck a balance, um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, that have struck a balance between sex and gender in a legislative solution manner. But this is this is bad. So this this is why this is the big problem. Next slide. Um, so why do we need gender identity? if sex stereotypes is included under Title VII already? And the answer is we don't need it. So that's that's another thing that we can talk about when we talk to our representatives and say, like, there is this really good, you know, case law and like it is sex stereotypes and gender identity are basically synonymous. However, that train has left the station. And I mean, feminists were asleep on this issue for a long time. Um, I came out in 1989. I met my first trans person sometime in the early 90s. I did not really fully get that this was an issue until like 1997, 1998, when in my home state, I'm sorry, my adopted home state of Maryland, legislation was introduced with this concept. It was the first time I had seen this. And I read it and I was like, 
this is a huge problem. I was like 27. <laughs> and and like, you know, Free State Justice Campaign, which was the gay rights group in Maryland at the time, was all like, this is the brand. Da, da, da. And there was one other lesbian who was at this conference and isn't here right now. And I was like, can we talk about this? <laughs> this is a problem. And she's like, this is a problem. So um, we kept it out of our law when we passed the Sexual Orientation Anti-Discrimination Act in 2001. Subsequently, the law in Maryland was amended in a way that I think strikes a balance. But the point here is that the train has left the station. So if you really want gender identity to not exist, you need a time machine. You know, you need a time machine. And if you have a time machine, there's probably better things to do with it than this, but you know, whatever. Um, so my perspective on how you organize around this is, is you can try to limit the harm of this type of initiative, because that's all you can do is like triage at this point. There's a lot of women in the gender critical community that are like, we're gonna create this thing and this isn't gonna exist. And like, if you wanna do that, that is your right. I am not going to do that. I'm not interested in that. I don't care about it. If that makes me a trans activist all of a sudden, that's fine. I don't care. Um, I don't recommend it. You do what you want, because I'm not your boss. Next slide. So how do you limit the harm? Well, you have you can try to amend the definition of gender identity to distinguish it from sex stereotypes. Um, you could limit the definition to someone who seeks medical treatment. Um, there is a document that I think it was written in like 1990. Um, this is also on genderidentitywatch.com, which I no longer control. Ironically, Wolf controls it now because I didn't want to have it anymore. Isn't that, thank you again, my one true love. Um, <laughs> So um, there was this Transgender Bill of Rights, which set out like in 1990, here are all the things we want. I encourage you to look for it and read it. It is a brilliant document. It's a brilliant strategy. It was like, let's aim for the stars. They, they've executed flawlessly, brilliantly. It's very impressive from an organizing standpoint. Um, and one of the things they did was to like work on like how uh, transgenderism is treated on, by WPATH. I don't follow all that stuff. Other people know more about that than me. Um, I still, I think it's still true that in order to get hormones to transition, you need a doctor's prescription. I mean, like yeah, legal, legally. Yeah, I mean, you can clearly buy them on the internet. And like to get like surgical interventions, you need a doctor to do that. So it seems to me one way to limit the definition of gender identity is to connect it to someone's engagement with the medical system Again, I'm not interested in the cultural argument for this and the wisdom of that type of medical treatment. Um, that's a whole other conversation for a different conference that I didn't help put on. Um, another way to limit the, the definition or the harm that comes from gender, gender identity is to add like some duration belief or consistency requirements. And there are state laws that have done this. And so duration is like, I've asserted that I was this gender identity for like a period of time, which, which cuts against the like, he could say he's a man and then he's a woman and then he's a man, like it, cutting against that, right? And like, I don't, I mean, from a radical feminist perspective, like, I don't know, like, I don't like, I prefer tying it to medical treatment, but this is another way to talk about it with, with your representatives. Like, don't you think there should be some duration on how long you've asserted this? Um, or some indication of your belief or consistency. So consistency, you know, consistency is like, I've presented myself this way for however long. Um, the other thing I really think needs to happen is don't put gender identity along with sex. Like keep them very separate and make sure they're treated as different concepts under the law um, because it's not good to treat gender identity as part of sex under the law. Next slide. Um, another way to limit the harm is to protect sex specific space. And this gets to like keeping sex and gender identity different. So Maryland has done this by, um, they prohibit discrimination based on gender identity, but it doesn't, it doesn't apply to a private facility. Um, sorry, let me back up. Maryland prohibits discrimination uh, based on gender, gender identity and public accommodations, except uh, it does not apply to a private facility if the place of public accommodation in which the private facility is located makes available for the use of persons whose gender identity is different from their assigned sex at birth an equivalent private space. 
private facility means a facility that is designed to accommodate only a particular sex that is designed to be uh, used simultaneously by more than one use of, God, I can't say, one user of the same sex and three in which it is customary to disrobe and view of other users of this facility. Equivalent private space means a space that is functionally equal to the space made available to users of a private facility. That's a whole lot of words to say. You have facilities for women, you have facilities for trans women. Like you have like, you know, you have your place, I have my place. We already have this under the law, right? We have men's rooms and women's rooms. So now we're gonna have like men's rooms, women's rooms, trans women's rooms, you know, trans men's room, whatever, family rooms. Like that's fine. Like that kind of thing, the burden of that type of thing is gonna be on businesses. It's not gonna be on people. So, you know, I find it really interesting that US Chamber of Commerce supports this legislation. Has no one pointed out to them there's a lot of burden on small businesses, but that's a different argument for a different conference because radical feminists don't care about businesses, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's the libertarian feminist conference that I'm gonna do next year, okay. Uh, next slide, please, okay. So after all of this, um, I just wanna say why aligning with right-wingers is a bad idea. We had a panel or a brief panel before this where women got up and said what they thought. There's lots of opinions on this. And I, I just wanna say, I'm as entitled to an opinion as any other person. And my opinion is just as valid as anyone else's opinion. And so I've had a lot of uh, personal attacks lobbed against me because I have this opinion, which I find very amusing because in 2011, <laughs> I had lots of personal attacks lobbed against me by the other side of this argument. Like transgender and gender critical are two sides of the same coin, in my opinion. A radical feminist analysis is a holistic analysis that's intended to get to the root of women's oppression under patriarchy. It's not about me personally. It's not about anyone's ego. I don't care. Honestly, if you want to talk about me personally, none of this impacts me personally. Like I am privileged and blessed to have, I'm, I'm like, I have a great job, I have a great family, I have money. I'm not impacted by this. I'm talking about this because it matters from a radical feminist perspective. <sighs> For some reason, I don't know, because I'm a masochist. Um, but the problem, in my opinion, with aligning with the right wing position on this is they oppose both sexual orientation and gender identity. Like they, don't like any of us because we're faggots and dykes. Mm -hmm. And I'm a dyke first. Like if everyone has done this like inventory of themselves, like who are you? If you haven't done this, I encourage you to like, who are you? Like, what do you stand for? And like my homosexuality is a precious gift from my creatrix. Woo. Thank you. <laughs> I, I mean, it is the thing that like set me free and gave me my life. Yes. And, 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 Without that, I would be nothing. I would be miserable. I would be a happy person. So I care about lesbians. I care about women. I care about lesbians. So aligning with the right wing is not a caring solidarity move towards lesbians. It's just not. You can spin it any way you want. You can say, well, so-and-so is a lesbian and they're saying it. I don't care. I don't. Read the Heritage Foundation's website. Put in homosexuality, it's filth. Look at the Republicans that are questioning their invited witness. Look at the things they've advanced and put forth. Is that who we are? It is not who I am. This is my public statement. This is not who I am. This is not radical feminism, which is fine because some of the stuff I've been talking about is also not radical feminism. It's compromise, which I think I said at the beginning. It's gender identity in the law. So our interests are not aligned with right-wingers. I also think you're weakening your message. Um, if we have a, a theory of liberation as radical feminists, like we're, we're working with people who are, who, who are opposed to our liberation, that's kind of confusing. I can't live with all that cognitive dissonance. Maybe you can. And if you can, that's fine. You will be criticized. <laughs> by me <laughs> and this one other person. <laughs> and I'm okay with that because I'm okay with saying unpopular things because I'm a masochist. Um, the other thing is, is just from a, a tactic standpoint, no one wants to listen to you when you're talking about pedophiles and all this stuff 
Like you sound crazy. I know that you think you sound great. And to your little small bubble group, you're all like clapping each other on the back. I'm telling you, as someone who engages with people in the broader community on a professional basis, this whole conversation seems nuts, like completely nuts. And it's hard for the like broader community to figure out who are the nuts and who are not the nuts. So y'all seem like nuts. So I'm just saying as an organizer, the messaging is sloppy. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a, a screenshot from Scumarama. Does anyone remember Scumarama? So Scumarama was a blog that was active, I don't know, like in the early 2000s um, and ended, I don't know, maybe like 2013. Um, and it was uh, done by Fat Check Me, who was Feminade. How many people here know Feminade? Look up Fact Check Me and Feminate. She's brilliant. This woman is brilliant. Like, and she's a straight woman, and she like knew the deal with this stuff before a lot of the like lesbians figured it out. So naturally, we became internet friends. Um, but this is a great graphic that talks about, um, you know, the argument when you make. Uh, sorry, this is a, this is from a post that's called like women. Uh, women are stupid, and rad femmes are conservative. Because what has been happening to radical feminists prior to the stuff with the Equality Act is people are saying, oh, you're, you're conservative, you're saying these things, which means you're a Republican. So uh, from my perspective, what you're saying opposing gender identity looks exactly the same. Um, and then they are uh, elucidating the difference between a right-wing agenda and a liberation agenda. So a right-wing agenda is we own women, we control reproduction, Women are our sexual and reproductive slaves. Like that is the party, that's the Republican Party, that's the Heritage Foundation. That is their agenda. Is that your agenda? No. <laughs> is that your agenda? No. What's a radical feminist agenda? Women's liberation away from men, women's safety from male violence and the female specific harms of the penis. This is Fact check me, she's pretty radical. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a different agenda. So, so when we're aligning with this one group where it looks on the surface we have something in common, the underlying stuff, who do you think's gonna win? Who do you think's gonna win? The Heritage Foundation is like a multi-million dollar organization. Seven billion? That's amazing. It's we're having a fat a live fact check. It's a, it's a huge how, how much money does Wolf have? Like, who do you think's gonna win? Do, do people know what a patsy is? Okay, like, come on. That's all I'm gonna say about that. So next slide, please. So um, I've, I, I'm actually cutting into lunch. I could go a little bit longer if people have questions. Um, I do wanna encourage you to follow us on social media. Um, we've been live tweeting some stuff from today from the conference and posting on Twitter and Instagram. Um, you know, and like some, someone said in response to the fact that we were criticizing the move to work with the Heritage Foundation, well, you don't have a platform. I'm like, oh, I'm not popular. Ooh. Like, you know, women have been building platforms for years and years and years. And I, I don't mean to express my ego, but I will for this one moment. Um, I started this recent conversation. Like there was a handful of us who started this recent conversation. Thank you. I mean, like, I, I'm gonna take credit for that because a lot of these like gender critical women, when I started this, like they were like, you're a bigot, Kathy Brennan. So like, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. There are women in the room who did that. And now we're friends. So um, like, don't ever let someone dissuade you from doing something because you don't have a big platform. Fuck you. I'm making my own platform and you can come or not. So I'm glad you came though. So thank you. So that's what talk about. And um, so for, for women with questions, this is hopefully being live streamed. Um, so you'll be your your voice will be heard, but if you don't want your don't use your name. But what's your question? Oh, um, well, it was when you were talking about the, you were saying like this is a huge overreach, and I'm forgetting a little bit what the, um, the slide was, but I think it was about, um, was it about, like, yeah, 
Yeah. Or maybe it was about the bathrooms, but my main thing was, um, so when we go to our representative and we say that we find this passage really problematic, would we just say, instead of um, saying that um, transgender people can all use the um, bathroom that goes with what they, you know, say that they're gender or their sexes, um, that they would all be entitled to their own designated documents. But then you address that later. Right. Period. Yeah. Okay. So right. just just like the strategy and talking to the yeah, so so how many people here have talked to their representatives about it? And I don't mean send an email, I mean actually gone to talk to them. <laughs> about anything. Like talk to them. So like how you present yourself matters. It's like in any context, like how how do you how do you want to be, you know, how do you want to be heard? Do you want to be understood? Like how do you talk about things? And like that's the way that it is. Like I'm sorry if that hurts people's feelings, but like that that's that's how like this is this messy stuff is done of making laws. It's like you go and you talk and you make your best case. And like you you how do you make your best case? Like you wear clean clothes, you like arrive on time, you like bring, maybe bring supporting papers, you don't yell at the person you're talking to, <laughs> you know, like it's like it's like interviewing for a job. Like you want to get the job, you know, Ruth? Uh, yeah. So I love your presentation and really inspired me to talk to my representative. Uh, and I, uh, is this going to be available? This is online. online. It's being live streamed, but does that mean it's saved? Uh, yeah, it's being also being filmed. Um, and this, the PowerPoint itself is already online. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to add that since the age of 19, I have chosen to only see women for my health care needs particularly any kind of OBGYN needs. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I can choose who my healthcare provider is. I can also spot trans people on a mile away. But <clears throat> if I was a poor woman who didn't have an option like at a low income clinic, yeah, and I found out post my exam that I had been given an exam by uh, actual male body trans person, I would feel traumatized and violated. Mm -hmm. I feel like we also need to include, when we talk about legislation, that, and again, I'm, you know, respect and honor trans people's journey, but they're not me, and I have the right to say no and have my boundaries, that health trans health care providers i do believe need to disclose before they put their hands on people that, on women yes yeah, so, so so um the question or the comment related to uh transgender health care provider performing some sort of um more physically intimate service like we're not talking about are we talking about a dentist like you're talking about if you have to get naked like i'm trying to yeah and you know. of course the exception would be an emergency room right. right right so um that that is not covered in this law it's certainly something to to talk about um and there may be other ways to remedy that type of harm so there's a whole there's a whole body of law this is really getting dorky called tort law tort law torts so you might have a, a claim for a personal injury related to that um there there have been criminal prosecutions of people in case of like rape by deception i'm not suggesting that that is rape at all but like it would be that kind of theory um which may be cognizable but the point the larger point about poor women accessing a, a, a provider um, that gets federal funding, like that's that's part of the, the problem with this legislation because she can't maybe go anywhere else. So we should care about that sister, right? Yeah. Is there any other questions? I have a question. Is it a question? Yes. Okay. My question is, so uh, can you just simply say what our goal is with the equality? What whose goal is? What you think our goal should be. It, yeah. Equality. So in, in my opinion, and I think, can you go back to the, the slide? You probably already said it. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, the slide that says we can all agree. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wait, back. Go forward. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Hopefully we can all agree that no one should be denied credit, housing, employment, or access to actually public accommodation because they're transgender, right? So we all agree about that. So what we care about is where the Equality Act conflicts with women's sex-based rights. And then we highlight those sex-based rights. And if it's helpful, I can like, I could actually, I could do this. I could put together a letter that you can send your representative. Okay. I was hoping someone else would do that because like I, I'm, I work like 80, 60 hours. I work a lot and I, I took a whole day to do this. And afterwards I had to go home and like sleep for 10 hours because this is fucking exhausting. But yes, I'll do that for you. And then five talking points yeah, or something. Yeah. Or even. It yeah. takes a lot of work to do this. You can pick five talking we'll points out of this bar presentation. Bar. Yeah. One person. All right. So, yeah, so, yeah I, I can do that. But my, my, the way that I talk to my representative about this, Dutch Rupersberger, is to say, um, I support the Equality Act as a, as a lesbian who's been out since 1989. I understand the importance of anti-discrimination protections. However, as a woman, da 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 da. So, like, you do like the one-two punch. Like, it's always good to deliver a, a yes and no. Like, if you're coming in with strong no, strong no, strong no, no, no. Like, no one can hear you. You know. Um, the other thing I just want to mention briefly that happened at that hearing is um, the person who testified at the invitation of Republicans against the Equality Act was asked a question about sex stereotypes, and they they didn't understand what sex stereotypes were. And it seemed to me they were advocating the position that we should just have discrimination protections based solely on sex. So it seemed to me what they were advocating was a free Price Waterhouse view, which is deeply anti-feminist. <laughs> and in my opinion, deeply wrong. Thank you for the snaps. So um, are there any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Did you say 90 billion? 90 million. million. 90 million and 100 million. Okay, so the Heritage Foundation has an annual budget of 90 million? Revenue. Reven annual revenue of 90 million, 100 million. Oh my God. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, so when you're sharing those articles from the Daily Signal and you're sharing those articles from the Heritage Foundation, like, I guess, congratulations. I don't know. You get your name in the paper. <laughs> of the Heritage Foundation. Yes, happy for you individually. I don't know. I'm not interested. So thank you for that. Any other questions? No? Okay, have a good lunch. See you back at two? Two? Is it two or one? 1.30. 1.30? Okay, thank see you, you later. Man.